Today we're uh, finishing up our series on Deuteronomy. And I just want to speak uh, this morning about the radical nature of the Torah, the laws contained within the book, and the trajectory that they set for the future. If we can pair Deuteronomy to the Babylonian code of Hammurabi, uh, we notice some real differences. In Babylonian law, people are just not equal under the law. Age, profession, class, gender, they all dictate the punishments and also the remedy. And yet Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 17 says, Do not show partiality when judging. Here both the small and the great alike. Do not be afraid of anyone, for judgment belongs to God. Bring me any case too hard for you and I will hear it. And that's what um, Moses says to the people. And the belief that everyone is made in the image of God, both men and women, freeborn and slave, foreigner and Israelite, is such a radical belief that it just ripples throughout history from the Israelites outwards. Uh, an agnostic historian, Tom Holland, author of the excellent book Dominion, How the Christian Revolution Remade the World, says this. He says the idea that human rights just hang in the ether waiting to be discovered is as theological as believing that Jesus Christ rose from the dead and sits at the right hand of the Father. He adds all men have been created equal and endowed with inalienable rights to life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Are not remotely self-evident truths. The most American believe they were owes less to philosophy than to the Bible. Again, you know, Tom Holland is an agnostic. He's not a Christian, and yet he recognises that human rights and their values are rooted in a Christian worldview. And for us living in the 21st century, we cannot even begin to imagine a world in which Christian values do not shape the very air that we breathe. Julius Caesar ran for office in the Roman Republic, boasting that he had killed a million Gauls in France and enslaved a million more. Just imagine a politician today, you know, that being his election campaign, <laughs> saying, you know, I've killed millions of people and enslaved millions more. Can you imagine the Facebook ad? You know, vote Julius, make Rome great again. You know, he's killed millions, he's enslaved millions more. You know, and that's meant to meant to want to vote for this chap. It's a world in which, you know, unwanted and disabled children are just left on roadsides or on rubbish heaps or in the drains and just left there to die. And if they are saved, it's only to be raised as slaves or sold into brothels. It's a world in which the powerful could do exactly what they liked with who they liked. And... They could do whatever they wanted with the weak. And it was celebrated as such. In that world, the Israelites lived in, they thought, you know, that the humans had been created by the gods by mixing the things of earth with the things of heaven, with the blood of a slain god, to create a slave race in order to serve the gods. And it's a bit like modern people, you know, who claim they're created by aliens, manipulating the DNA of monkeys. You know, why, why would they do that? OK, it's about slavery. It's about ownership. It's about um, stamping mine here. And in whatever case, they're created to serve and you're slaves of your makers. You owe them. And in the bland materialistic story, humans are simply accidents of evolution. They've got no purpose. They've got no ultimate destiny. And it could very well have been otherwise. If either of those are true, then what we believe about human dignity, about human rights, they're just simply not true. In the ancient world, certain bloodlines had more divine blood than other bloodlines. The kings, the rulers, the emperors, they're just better than other people because of their blood. And if there's some sort of just blind evolution is true, then why can't the weak do what they like with the, why can't the strong, sorry, do what they like with the weak? Why can't the wolves prey on the sheep? Why would it be wrong to wipe out the weak so that they can't pass on their defective bad genes or whatever it might be? Surely survival is of the fittest. 
what stands against all of these beliefs, all of these ideas, is that all humans, all humans are created equal because they're equally made in the image of God, both men and women, freeborn and slave, foreigner and Israelite. It's a religious belief based upon religious claims. And Tom Holland in Dominion writes that every human person possesses equal dignity is not a remotely self-evident truth. A Roman would have laughed at it. To campaign against discrimination on the grounds of gender or sexuality, however, is to depend on large numbers of people sharing a common assumption that everyone possesses inherent worth. The origins of this principle, as Nietzsche has so contemptuously pointed out, lay not in the French Revolution, nor in the Declaration of Independence, nor in the Enlightenment, but in the Bible. So with this in mind, the fact that all of our basis of human rights, uh, that everyone is equal, that we're all created by God uh, as equals, we've all got equal value and worth, that they're theological ideas, you can't get them by nature. You know, they're rooted in the Bible and in scripture. So let us go back to the Bronze Age, to the Iron Age, in a world in which rules exist only to protect the powerful, to ensure that their property rights are protected. And Israel offers a very different light to the world. Scholars have noticed that the laws within Deuteronomy have perhaps three main categories. Number one, laws emphasising the value of human life and human dignity. An example would be how to treat runaway slaves in Deuteronomy 23:16. Uh, Let them live among you wherever they like and whatever town they choose. Do not oppress them. Or women captives of war, Deuteronomy 21. Rather than just rape captives of war, Israelites are told to give a captive a month to get used to the idea of being married. Um, and then if they still don't please you, you're to, quote, let her go wherever she wishes. Do not sell her or treat her as a slave since you've dishonoured her. Basically, let her go. If she doesn't get used to the idea or want to marry you, let her go. There was restrictions on excessive corporal punishment, lest a victim be degraded, Deuteronomy 25, 1 to 3. There's proper burials after executions, Deuteronomy 31, 22, 23. Building regulations in order to minimise the danger of human life, Deuteronomy 22, verse 8. There's, secondly, laws dealing with interpersonal social relations. So that's calls for the assistance of foreigners, of orphans, of widows and the poor, of enjoying a positive attitude towards those marginal groups. Regulation of property rights, warning against the treatment of favouring a special child above others. Um, and number three, third category, laws dealing with humane treatment of animals. Examples include prohibition against taking a mother and her young from the nest or the requirement to refrain from muzzling an ox while it's treading out the grain. So in an era of might is right, Israel was told to look after runaway slaves, look after foreigners, orphans, widows and the poor. It's what theologians call the preferential option of the poor. That God gives preference to the well-being of the poor and the powerless within society. Jesus himself taught on Judgment Day, God will ask what each person did. You help the poor and needy. He'll say this, Amen, I say to you, whatever you did to one of the least of my brothers of mine, you've done to me. Deuteronomy effectively established the world's first perhaps social welfare system. We read in Deuteronomy chapter 14 verses 28 to 29. At the end of every three years, bring all your tithes of the year's produce and store it in your towns so that the Levites who've got no allotment or inheritance of their own, foreigners, the fatherless and widows who live in your towns may come and eat and be satisfied so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the works of your hands. The tithes are to be stored up in order to feed the Levites, but also the foreigners, the orphans, the widows, the vulnerable in society. In Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 7 to 11, we read, If anyone is poor among your fellow Israelites, in any of the towns that the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted towards them. Verse 11, they will always be poor in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open handed towards your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy 
in your land. In Deuteronomy 24 verse 17 we read, Do not deprive a foreigner or the fatherless of justice, nor take the cloak of a widow as pledge. In Leviticus 25 verses 35 to 37 we read, If any of your fellow Israelites become poor, unable to support themselves among you, help them as you would a foreigner as a stranger, so they can continue to live among you. Do not take interest or any profit from them, but fear your God, so that they may continue to live among you. You must not lend them money at interest, nor sell them food at a profit. So there's a handful of examples here of all the sorts of laws that God has given Israel. The laws don't exist for the benefit of the rich, but rather to meet the needs of the poor. Many of you might be aware of how it's forbidden to charge interest upon loans in Islamic law. What is less known, perhaps, is that it was also forbidden in Christianity as well until the time of the Reformation. John Calvin was the first of the reformers to break on this, and Henry VIII's parliament in 1545 was the first to allow interest on commercial loans in, the, in England. In the Middle Ages, if you charged an interest on a loan, you would be denied baptism, communion, and you'd be unable to have a Christian burial. This was based upon outworkings of ver verses such as Deuteronomy 23, 19. Do not charge a fellow Israelite interest, whether on money or food or anything else that may earn interest. Or Leviticus 25, 37. You must not lend them money at interest, nor sell them food at a profit. Friends, what might God find troubling in our present society? That's another question, isn't it? We can easily point out things like abortion, but being pro-life is more than just about those who were never born. It's also about those who were born. So how we treat the vulnerable in our society. So issues like unemployment, addiction, debt, modern slavery, housing, workers' rights and pay, migrants, refugees. All of these become issues about righteousness, about rightness, how we act. Do we care for the people that God cares about? Not just those who were never born, but those who were born and now live in poverty. What does God think about our modern banking systems and loan sharks and other things? How might we in the parks benefit the people in the parks, in the wider community? We can think of parenting courses or job courses or marriage courses. The work of people like Safe Families and Christians Against Poverty, they're vital and needed within our local community. And as we think about becoming a separate charity, going forward, we need to think about those outreaches that we can be involved on and how we can bring justice into our local community. In 2013 and 14, when the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, took on Wonga and the payday loans, he was doing what Jeremiah, one of the prophets, would have done. God cares about injustice. In Jeremiah 22, 16, we read, He gave justice and help to the poor and needy. Everything went well for him. Isn't that what it means to know me, says the Lord? So, friends, God defines knowing him as giving justice helping the poor and the needy so if we say we know god then we need to act like we know god one of the verses that i love in deuteronomy is deuteronomy 23 24 if you enter your neighbor's vineyard you may eat all of the grapes that you want but do not put them in a basket i love this perhaps i should go to Lockmead and put this verse into practice i'm going to eat all the strawberries i can but as long as i don't have a basket and the idea is that the poor, the vulnerable, the homeless are permitted to eat from farmers' fields, but they can't steal it and then sell it on in the marketplace. We've got a whole book about this practice called Ruth, where we're introduced to a foreigner, a migrant, who's following behind the harvesters, picking up the bits that they've dropped for herself to eat. And the owner of the field doesn't chase her away. Rather, he gives her food and drink and then later goes on to marry her. Deuteronomy also provides perhaps the first health and safety regulation. I've already mentioned this in Deuteronomy 22.8. We read, when you build a new house, make a parapet around your roof so that you will not bring the guilt of bloodshed upon your house if someone falls from your roof. There's also animal rights, employment law. In 1 Timothy 
Chapter 5, 18, Paul writes, For the scriptures say, Do not muzzle an ox while it's treading out in its grain, and the worker deserves his wa wages. He's quoting Deuteronomy and also Jesus from Luke's Gospel. And Paul applies the Deuteronomy passage about oxen in a spiritual manner to speak about employing of um, particularly ministers and others um, in employment rights. So he takes that verse about oxen in a spiritual manner. And friends, God cares about these things. Living in the 21st century, many of us um, take for granted, uh, especially within our worldview, that there's natural things like human rights, um, which are rather rooted in a Christian worldview and a Christian understanding of the world. Why does every single person have rights? Why are they valued? Why do they have any value at all? Is because they're made in the image of God. It's a theological reason, not one based upon science. You know, or one based upon just natural law or anything else. Because if natural law is evolution or something like that, just some unguided process, why can't the weak um, be just the prey of the strong? You know, it's about a theological reason rooted in Christianity. Today, we think slavery is awful, but for the vast majority of human history, it was just seen as normal. No one could even imagine how society could work without it. St. Gregory of Nyssa uh, from 335 to 395 AD is the first recorded person in history to object outright to slavery. And he does so based upon the fact that humans are the image of God. And who has the right to own an image of God except God himself? He's got a theological reason why slavery is wrong. It was so radical that even the other bishops in the church at the time just couldn't, you know, they were thinking, what about captives in war? What about the mentally insane? You know, surely they can just be treated as slaves because otherwise, how are they going to eat? How are they going to be looked after themselves? They can't get gainful employment. So why can't they be owned by someone? And he's saying, no, no, they're made in the image of God. It's such a radical idea rooted in the Bible. And it's based upon Christian beliefs about humanity being the image of God and therefore everyone has equal rights. We've forgotten how radical Christianity was and is. It upends power structures. The last will be first and the first will be last. Tom Holland reminds us just how strange Christianity was to the Romans. He writes, So vast had the scope of Roman power become that any man who succeeded in making himself its master was liable to seem less human than divine. Divinity then was for the very greatest of the great, for victors, for heroes, for kings. Its measure was a power to torture one's enemies, not to suffer it oneself, to nail them to rocks of a mountain or to turn them into spiders, to blind and crucify them after conquering the world, that a man who had himself been crucified might be hailed as a god, could not help but be seen by people everywhere across the world as scandalous, obscene, grotesque. The ultimate offensiveness, though, was to one particular people, Jesus' own. I'm reminded of Mary's song in Luke chapter 1 verses 52 53 where she sings he has brought down rulers from their thrones but has lifted up the humble one he's filled the hungry with good things but he's sent the rich away empty friends the God spoken about in Deuteronomy who's revealed in Jesus Christ is one who cares for runaway slaves for foreigners for orphans for widows and the poor as Mary sings, he's brought down rulers from their thrones and has lifted up the humble. He's filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. Friends, if your focus is on the things of this life, about money, sex and power, then lift your eyes to the greater good. There is another way to be human, a way revealed in Jesus Christ, a way in which the greatest here are actually the least, and those who are least here are actually the greatest. Jesus Christ, the same one who met face to face with Moses upon the mountain, the one who gave Deuteronomy 
that same person stepped into Israel's story to fulfill the promises that he had made to Israel. He was born of a virgin from David's line. He died for our sins, removing them from us. He took the burden of our sins, yours and mine. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. He was raised on the third day and he appeared to many, showing he was really raised from the dead. And now he's seated at the right hand of God as Lord, Priest, King and Messiah. And he will come again as judge to set the world to right. Just as he'd been with Israel in the cloud and in the flame in the wilderness, now he's within each of us by his Holy Spirit. Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. God made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him we would become the righteousness of God. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 9. And to be found in him, not because I have my own righteousness derived from the law, but because I have a righteousness that comes by way of Christ's faithfulness. A righteousness from God that is in fact based upon Christ's faithfulness. Friends, we're okay with God. Not because we get it right all the time, because we don't. We mess up, we sin, we get things wrong. But as Paul says, we have a righteousness that comes by way of Christ's faithfulness. A righteousness that comes that is in fact based upon Christ's faithfulness, not ours. He provides the way when there was no way. He provides light when there was only darkness. So in conclusion, friends, in Micah chapter 6, verse 8, we read, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Friends, may those words define each of us this week. May we seek to act justly, even to do good to our enemies, to love our enemies and pray for them. To love mercy in all of our dealings with each other and our neighbours and to walk humbly with God, not acting as if we're already perfect and that we've already got it all together. Because we don't, but rather trusting in Christ's faithfulness for us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the radical book of Deuteronomy that upends all of the world's power structures and, and ideals, Lord. That it's not, the power is found in weakness, in the things of the cross, upon the suffering one upon the cross. But that is where true victory is found, not in power over people but in power under in serving leadership and in serving others we thank you lord that you've revealed a god of love who loves us even his enemies enough to die for them amen